I will, I will uh, screen share here soon, but I just wanted to introduce myself to everyone for anyone who doesn't know me. Um, my name is Cheryl Lala, and I am the Director of Training and Career Coaching here at EOS and Parity. Um, I am a former professional golfer, many moons removed at this point. I used to play golf at Cal as well as some mini tours for the LPGA. So welcome, everyone. I've been doing this with uh, EOS for a little over a year now, and um, yeah. Just excited to continue these webinars. This is our second round, actually, of webinars that we've done. So welcome. <laughs> and feel free to email me if y'all need anything. I will put my email in the chat. Awesome. What do you think, Lauren? Should we get started? Yeah, let's do it. So this is meant to be a little interactive. So it would be great for those of you who don't have your cameras on to start your camera once we at least get to the interactive part. It's like you're kind of finishing something up right now. Um, Cheryl's going to talk a little bit and we have a bit of a PowerPoint, um, but what I envisioned this to be was a safe space for people to have like honest conversations about imposter syndrome. Um, and then I think my favorite part about parity is women tackling issues that impact women ourselves and built. <laughs> <laughs> But Bill says he's 60% female, so it works. <laughs> it works. Uh, okay. Yeah, before we start, do you think that we could get a quick introduction from folks and just, you know, uh, maybe your name and, uh, you know, what you're looking to get out of the webinar today and your sport? That would really help me um, quite a bit. And if it doesn't feel too, too school-like, if you wouldn't mind, if I would just pick on people, if that's okay, <laughs> just to make it easier in terms of flow. Is that all right if I do that? Okay, so I'm just going to go down our list. Um, uh, let's see, Tiffany, you're our first person down on our list. I knew I was going to be first. <laughs> I was like, not trying to make eye contact with this. Sorry, thing, sorry. <laughs> looking at this, this other white wall. Um, yeah. No, it's totally fine. Um, well, I'm Tiffany Parker, um, originally from Southern California, LA area. Shout out, whoop, whoop, Lauren. She's Chula Vista right now. Um, on the U.S. bobsled team, came from USA Track and Field as a heptathlete. Um, and what, yep. Yeah. Saw it, Bill, track and field. Um, yeah, what I want to get out of this, I think um, I had a very interesting transition from track and field to bobsled where uh, you have a bad race and no one remembers it. They only remember the good races, but for bobsled, like you do one thing wrong and your whole career is shit. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you for being so candid. We love it. <laughs> Next being person. Candid, if she, knew, she knows if she didn't tell the truth, I would, I would rat her out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lauren's here for the accountability, Facts. I guess, right? <laughs> uh, Krista. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm sorry. I'm like trying to multitask and do like my day job here at the same time. Um, so in my day job, I'm an attorney. Um, I do uh, prosecution for a county here uh, in Minnesota. And um, I also do CrossFit and Olympic weightlifting um, as a master's athlete on the side. Awesome. And um, I am just interested in conversations because I feel like as an attorney, I see and an athlete, I see men, I don't know, applying and getting all these jobs that they're not, I, I'm just like, how do you get these jobs all the time? Anyways, um, so I guess I'm just always interested in the conversation about imposter syndrome and how women can just be more empowered to get out there and, and do like be bold, like apply for things, go, go for the goal, whatever. Um, and I'm going to turn my camera off only because I'm also trying to eat my lunch. So I don't, not, everybody doesn't need to watch me eat. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we will do an exercise a little bit later. Well, where if you can turn on your cameras for us, that would help us with the exercise, but we don't need it the whole time just for that exercise would be great. Uh, Devin, next person. Hi, um, I am coming from sunny California, but I'm actually from the South. 
So um, I've actually been watching Lauren, like one of the stalkers on Instagram forever, but she actually um, helped me get through a transition in my life. Um, I was originally in marketing and actually had really excelled and I essentially got offered a VP position um, in a nonprofit business um, at 27 and I left it and decided to go be a nurse because I was like, "Mm." and I think I developed imposter syndrome. Like they're going to figure out that I'm not as good as they think I am. And so I left something that was actually really fun to do something else. I'm still happy. I've learned a lot and gotten a lot out of this three to four year transition. Um, And then at the same time, I discovered workout. Not that I joined because I'm an athlete. I've always wanted to be an athlete, but that's not been um, my natural calling. Um, But I definitely, the imposter syndrome, I've always wondered about it. I've heard it channeled through a lot of my friends and I don't actually grasp entirely what it was until Lauren talked about it today on her stories. And I was like, whoa, that could relate to what I'm dealing with now because I just graduated. I'm job searching, but I'm in this weird space with it. Um, And kind of like, should I go back to marketing? Should I go in, you know, and the pandemic did not help with all of this. So (laughs) in my head, Um, so less on the athlete side, though I support you all. And um, it's been my own, um, I've had many athletes actually help inspire me to stay strong um, in certain areas when I've been going through nursing school. So it's been a connection, but not a direct connection. Anybody who has a body is an athlete, just so you know. Thank you. Um, I do weight train. Um, So there's that. Um, I actually got into it literally as the transition happened. So I I weight train uh, minus the gyms being closed right now, obviously. So I just take myself on walks right now. But uh, no, I love it. I tried Olympic lifting. Um, not quite there yet, <laughs> but I I do love weight training. Deadlifts are like the most empowering thing on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're about, empowerment. So thank you so much, Devin, for sharing. And we look forward to hearing more from you throughout the, throughout the uh, hour here. Uh, Emily, you are up next. Emily, if you want to just do an introduction, um, that'd be great. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily. I'm on the U.S. Luge team, and I am here uh, really just to learn. I think um, I've had a lot of conversations with Lauren just over coffee or at, or at lunch or whatnot, and this is something that I think I need to be more aware of is imposter syndrome and, and really just prepare because I've been, I'm on the national team. I'm, I've done all the things here, but eventually I'm going to move on to something else in my life. So I just want to be more prepared for that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Katura. Hey everyone. Um, I'm Katura and I'm originally from New Jersey, but I live in multiple states now. <laughs> um, I'm a track and field athlete and I just join the webinar because this topic interests me as you guys all said feel like I feel the same things as y'all so just wanting to learn more awesome thank you so much Katura Shannon are you able to- hi guys um I'm Shannon Robery I'm a track and field athlete as well um middle distance mostly and in the 14th year of my career as a professional athlete but the second year as a mom um, and an athlete so I think one of the interesting things to me is just you know over the last couple of years trying to get back to fitness um, you know the narrative is even before I had a baby was well should we give her another contract because she is over 30 and might get pregnant now I'm 35 and I've had a kid and, you know, just trying to come back and, you know, getting rid of that, that dialogue of, um, of, I can't. Oh no, I think Shannon cut out on us. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the beauty of somebody else. I oh. believe it. So, um, I- you cut out on us for a second there, Shannon. Sorry. 
Sorry, yeah, um, I'm just finishing up practice, so that's the my excuse. But, but yeah, it just um, kind of, I guess it was twofold. What I was trying to say is twofold. One, pre-baby, this idea of you know, saying I wanted to be the best in the world at something and yet not really believing it deep in my gut. And um, postpartum, trying to, you know, achieve what I'm capable of and eliminate that narrative of just because I'm 35 and have had a kid that I can't. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing. And Danielle. Hi, my name is Danielle. I am volleyball and I just saw Lauren was presenting. I said, let me check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lauren's the star of the show. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Awesome. And then Michelle, if you wanted to do an introduction as well, um, just let us know, you know, uh, what you hope to get out of the webinar and, and uh, your sport. That would be great. Michelle, I think you're on mute. There you go. <laughs> Are you? No, no. Okay. Well, Come on in whenever you want uh, to just kind of introduce yourself. We'll go ahead here and get started. Hopefully I haven't missed anyone. Um, uh, I'll have Lauren do a quick introduction of herself first. Of course, she, like I said, is the star of the show and then we'll go into our slideshow. <laughs> Hi, as some of you already know, my name is Lauren Gibbs, born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Um, have been an athlete all my life, though sometimes I wonder if that was my choice or just my calling, either way. Uh, sports have been a part of my life for a long time. Every time I try to get away from them, I get veered back in. So I'm just leaning into the sport thing. Um, I was really excited to talk about this. Just full disclosure, I took a growth marketing class. And like on our graduation day, uh, a woman gave a talk on this. And she played a video, which we will play at the end. And it just like, we did this exercise. And um there were a lot of things that came out that I didn't realize I still felt about myself because I have accomplished a lot and I have a lot to be proud of. Um, but it was insane. Like how many just things were rooted in like my thought process about myself that was potentially holding me back from really one reaching my true potential and doing just the things that I've always wanted to do, but maybe be been afraid to try. And so um, I felt like if I felt this way, then there were probably other women out there and men that felt that way as well. And so um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in imposter syndrome. I think Cheryl is probably more on that page, but I think what I am good at is hopefully getting a conversation going that um, can help us better understand and identify it within our own lives and then have some tools to utilize each other and other resources to combat it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And so, you know, Lauren and I combined wanted to do this uh, to kind of talk a little bit about imposter syndrome, give some technical definitions, see how it shows up for us, not only in sports, but in business and life. Uh, my background, like I said, I was a professional golfer. And then from there, I went on to coach college golf for about eight years. And while I was doing that, I, I got a graduate certification in mental skills training. And so a little bit of this is going to be kind of in conjunction with some of that, like, you know, mental skills training as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now and uh, pull up the slides. And feel free, if you all have any questions or anything, to stop us, unmute yourself, um, go ahead and ask, or you can ask it in the chat and I'll get to it as soon as I'm done sharing slides here. But essentially, this is you know our first round of webinar, our second round of webinars, the first one in our second round of webinars. We did uh, a, a first initial round of webinars about a month ago, and so this is now kicking it off again into our second round, and it is on imposter syndrome. Um, so the objective today is to empower yourself to understand kind of the difference between luck and imposter syndrome. And so we're saying, you know, in our in our title, is it luck? or is it an imposter syndrome? Let's kind of break that down a little bit. Um, let's also understand self-talk. You may understand this yourself as an athlete right now. What is What are the thoughts that are going into your brain? How does self-talk kind of uh, play into uh, your accomplishments, your personal narrative? We're going to break down self-talk a little bit. And then 
how do we build confidence in the business world? How do we take some of the skills that we've learned as athletes, um, as people who are excelling in a sport and use that same level of transferable skills into the business world so that the business world doesn't seem so scary for us? So those are our objectives today. Um, we're going to get into a technical definition of imposter syndrome. Uh, this is from the APA, uh, which is bas basically, you know, imposter syndrome is a psychological term. And it's referring to a pattern of behavior where people kind of doubt their accomplishments and have a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud. And so we will pass along these slides. There is a link in uh, the slide to notes where you can do some further research on basically what in imposter syndrome is. But it's not an actual disorder. It was coined uh, by clinical psychologists in 1978 when they found that despite people having a great deal of accomplishments, they still felt like they were kind of a fraud, right? Um, it, it, imposter syndrome has remain, you know, people with imposter syndrome feel like they are convinced that they don't deserve the success that they have. And so this is something that affects a great deal of people. It actually does affect men and women both significantly. Um, but in the business world and in sporting arenas, which is also considered a business endeavor as well, 66% of women actually feel like they do suffer from imposter syndrome. So this is a very real thing that's out there. It may not be a psychological, uh, you know, actual diagnosis, but it it is something that people definitely suffer from and experience and feel. Situations where imposter syndrome appears for female athletes. So anytime you're taking on something new, uh, that's when imposter syndrome can really kind of present itself, right? So when we're in the sports world, that could be our comfort zone, right? Being on the field, being as an athlete, being in the weight room, all those things are kind of comforting to us. Uh, those things are things that we do tried and true. Uh, we could have a little bit of nervousness, but we kind of feel accomplished in those arenas. As we start moving into new ventures, and that could be, you know, with business executives, talking about ourselves, giving an elevator pitch. These are things that we talk about a lot in professional development. Um, those things can be a little bit scary and it can make you feel like, I'm not capable. I, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. Those are the thoughts that may come up. And, and these are the situations that we're starting to experience some imposter syndrome. So if you've ever had those thoughts when you're trying to negotiate contracts and pay, if you're starting a new position, that's kind of like the worst thing, right? If you're starting a new position, you're going into a new office, you, maybe you're just doing it, you know, one day a week. And just because it's outside of your norm and outside of the comfort zone, you just have those limiting beliefs in your brain where you're like, I, I, this is not me. People you know, I don't know why they're hyping me up. This is not it. Right. Anytime you're kind of learning those new skills or challenging yourself to kind of get out of the comfort zone um, and you're having those negative and defeating thoughts, that's a situation where you're experiencing imposter syndrome because we know you're capable enough to really excel when it comes to sports. We, we know that you have accolades. We know that you have accomplishments, but you're still doubting that in the back of your mind. And that's where imposter syndrome is very prevalent. Now, feelings and thoughts. This is something that I was talking about in the last slide a little bit, right? What are some feelings and thoughts? Well, thinking that your success is equal to being lucky. I know I've done that personally myself, right? Is just feeling like, oh, you know, that was just luck. I was just in the right place at the right time. Anybody could have done it, right? All of those thoughts that are happening are also thoughts that are associated with imposter syndrome, unfortunately, right? And so we, kind of, we want to name it. We want to name the things that we're feeling because in naming it, we can start to address how to kind of move forward, right? So if you're thinking that your success is just really you being lucky, no, <laughs> no, right? We want to name that first. If you're feeling like you're not capable or worthy of the position you're moving into, if you're feeling like other people really don't know you all that well and, and that you're feeling kind of like a fraud, that they admire you for all the wrong reasons, if you're thinking that, you know, anyone could have accomplished the things that you've accomplished, or if you have a fear of failure in, in embarking on a new adventure or a new, uh, you know, business opportunity, all those things are feelings and thoughts that are associated with imposter syndrome. And it's really scary to talk about about these things, right? It's really scary to name them. It's scary to talk about them. It's scary to think them, right? And so we try to like kind of bury it in our minds, but in actuality, we kind of have to name it and, and bring it forward. Now, um, in talks about bringing it forward, I'm going to now go over to Lauren, who's really going to talk about this in a personal experience and, and how this has affected Lauren personally on as an athlete. Awesome. And like, it's funny. I don't know if any of you had this same kind of experience as she was reading over some of these things. It actually created anxiety in me as she's listing them off because I'm like, oh gosh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Um, 
And I wanted to get this because I feel like in my circle of friends, I'm seen as somebody that has all their shit together in, in, in some instances. Um, and I just said in some instances because part of my imposter syndrome is I've always been a very driven person, right? My parents always say I climbed out of my crib at eight months old before I could walk. Um, and I went to small schools where there weren't a ton of athletes, but athletes were seen as like, you know, the cool kids, but I never felt cool. Cause like, I just didn't. Right. And then I think my imposter syndrome is rooted in people's expectations of me and not wanting to let people down. And so I realized in my life, I've done a lot of work to one, avoid letting people down, which in turn would let myself down. Um, and two, trying to diminish my accomplishments, my work ethic, my sparkle, the shit that I just do really freaking well, just to make sure other people don't feel uncomfortable around me. Right? Because, and I think that happens a lot, especially to women. Right. You know, in, in business, it's if you're if you're tough, you're a bitch. Right. If in athletics, you're good and you know it, you're sh you're show off. Right. And so that's, I think, where my imposter syndrome has come from. Um, I grew up being told that I could be great at things. And I was that kid that always got along better with adults than I did with kids. <laughs> and so I was a kiss ass. Right. Um, and so that just kept making it worse. So I played a lot of sports growing up. Um, and I often question whether I played sports because I really loved sports or because people told me that I was an athlete. Um, and that till this day, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm grateful for what sport has given me and taught me. Uh, but I, I still don't know if that was really my choice. Uh, I settled on volleyball. My first love was figure skating. Um, at B5, 10, 190 pounds, figure skating wasn't in the cars for me. So I, I played soccer. I did track. I did all these other sports. I settled on volleyball. And I settled on volleyball because I was good at it, it and it could get me into brown. Um, and I remember that narrative kind of continuing when I went on my recruiting trip. And my, the coach was like, hey, you, you can come to Brown. Um, I think we can get you in. Um, you know, your grades are fine. I'll put you at the top of my list. Oh, by the way, it also doesn't help. It doesn't hurt that you're a minority. Right? And so that created in me like, well, maybe I'm not actually smart enough to be at Brown. And I'm just a charity case. It continued to get worse because, um, you know, as you make your way in the world and people ask you, you know, about your past and your schooling and your sport, they'd say, where do you go to school? I'd say, Brown. Oh, Brown. All right. It didn't matter how I said it. If I was like, Brown, they'd be like, just Brown, huh? Um, and it, it just continued to make me more uncomfortable. So I continued to try and diminish who I was to try and make people feel comfortable around me because I wanted to have friends. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want people not be around me. So I just continued to dim, dim, diminish myself. So finally I finished sports. I graduated from college and I was like, I'm done. I don't have to be the athlete anymore. So I go into to corporate. Um, I was unemployed for seven months in 2010, finally found a job was hired as a, as a sales manager for a very large company. I walked into my first day of work and I was like, holy corporate America, everything was beige. People were beige, the walls were beige, cubicles were beige, it was all beige. And I remember my boss looking at me, I had this really nice blouse on. I thought it was from H&M, it was orange and white striped. I had a Burberry jacket on and some slacks and he looked at me and he said, do you own professional clothes? And I was like, absolutely, they're just in my uh, storage because I'm in the process of moving. He's like, okay, cool. So, of course, I went to Brooks Brothers. My first meeting uh, with my team, the top rep on the team stopped meeting and said, how old exactly are you? And I was like, 27, how old are you? Right, but inside I was just like dead. I was like, oh, my gosh. 
Um, didn't love that job. As you all know, I quit it to go play bobsled instead. And to be completely honest, I tried out for bobsled as a joke and continue on in bobsled because I knew what I was doing. Um, didn't fit with who I was, but I didn't know what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. And so I thought, well, telling people that I'm trying to go to the Olympics is important enough to give me a pass for leaving my job. And so did that first year of bobsled, met many of you on here, really enjoyed it and thought, I'm going to go to the Olympics. Like, I'm going to do it. Started working harder, working harder. But I think because I started this sport as a joke, it was hard for me to take myself seriously that I could be an Olympian. And for me, an Olympian was somebody who started their sport at four and who committed their entire life to it. And so I just felt like I was cheating the system and that I was a fraud. And, and I, wor I knew I worked really hard, but I felt like I was taking advantage of the system um, and that it, it didn't seem to matter how well I did, I would never be a true Olympian, right? I wouldn't be like the other Olympians. And so as I continued on the space, I started to become the veteran on the team. And that made me even more uncomfortable because I still felt like I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and the summer after the Olympics was probably the toughest, darkest, scariest time in my life. And I thought that time had been 2010 and when I was 26 and unemployed and like wishing I didn't exist anymore. But it was really after I'd achieved all this stuff, after I had accomplished my goals, I kept trying to accomplish things and that feeling just wouldn't go away. In fact, it just kept getting worse because the more stuff I accomplished, the more people wanted to talk about my accomplishments. And in my head, all of my accomplishments had little asterisks next to them, right? Like, yes, I was an Olympic medalist after three and a half years, but I came in at the right time. Yes. I ran a very successful team and made a lot of money and bought a house before I was 30 asterisk. Like my co my co my coworker got fired and they couldn't find anybody else to run the whole team. So I just got lucky. Uh, yes. I've always been an athlete, but I was born muscular, right? All of the self-talk that I was doing and even some of the conversations, Emily, you and I've had these conversations, right? About me. Yeah. Was, the whole time you're doing this, I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're you, like, you didn't even said you didn't even say that you're an Olympic medalist till the end because you were still <laughs> avoiding it. Because to me, I still can't believe it happened, and and because I don't understand why it happened, how it happened, to a certain extent, I don't feel like I deserve it. You do appreciate you. So I'm gonna stop talking about myself there, and I want to get into this exercise, but hopefully. Uh, my vulnerability will challenge you all to share your own experiences so we can have a real conversation about this. So I know some of you are probably on TikTok. So I'm going to ask everybody to turn their cameras on. And you're like, why are you bringing up TikTok? Because uh, the concept is big on TikTok. All right. Michelle, can you turn your camera on? Bill, you got to turn your camera on too. Danielle? And you, you all can unmute yourselves as well, unless you're somewhere that's super loud. All right. Ten fingers up, everybody. Ready? Put a finger down. Sorry, I got to move it over so I can read it. Put a finger down. If you feel like I'm afraid people important to me may find out that I'm not as capable as they think I am. Put a finger down if I feel my success has been due to some kind of luck. Put a finger down 
if you feel like the reason I'm having the success I've had was because I was in the right place at the right time. Put a finger down if you tend to remember the incidents in which you've done your worst more than those times that you've done your best. Put a finger down if you're afraid that the people that look up to me might find out that I'm not as capable as they think I am. Put a finger down if you talk down, to, talk down about yourself or your accomplishments, accomplishments to make other people feel less intimidated by your success. Put a finger down if you apologize for things that you know that you shouldn't feel sorry about. Put a finger down if you are constantly thinking, my luck is about to run out. Put a finger down if sometimes you wish you could go back in time and choose a different path. Put a finger down if you're afraid that you're just not good enough or just not good anymore. All right. Um, I think it's a pretty powerful exercise. Anybody have any initial thoughts about it? Anything that surprised you? Anything that like really hit home? I think for me, um, it's easy for me. I, I still had three at the end, which I was surprised by, but I think I still had those three because I'm still in sport. But once I leave sport, I bet those are going to go down <laughs> because I find so much of my confidence here because like, because I, I, I am good, <laughs> but going into the next thing, who knows? Well, and Emily, I love hearing you say that because I know after the Olympics, we had a lot of conversations where you were questioning whether or not you should continue in sport. Uh, yeah. And I think it's amazing that you came back from what you did at the Olympics and then won a world championship medal, like casually. It was not casual, but yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone else? I thought the part about um, going back and starting over or changing the path that you would choose is really interesting because I think the more space I give myself to th think about even like the last five years or the last 10 years, I think I rewrite that multiple times in my head. And there's never a point where I like rewrite it and I'm calm or confident, more confident, but I'll, that one resonated with me a lot. And I don't think I realize the amount of times I'll do it in a day. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll second that. I think for me, it was like just different leaving a sport where I was like really, really good at it. Like I had a lot of success at it. I was by no means at the end of my career um, to venture off into something that was completely different that I knew nothing about. And I think, um, hearing like you have all this potential but not necessarily like seeing it or knowing like I hear I have this potential but like it's there's nothing tangible that you you personally feel like it's adding up um I think for me is like I was like shocked that I still had five fingers up but also like some of the things were like some of the questions I was like no I've actually never thought that like that I wasn't capable of doing something or that it was lucky it was like well no I just like had to work extremely hard and like my downfall is like I'll say like I'm not like a god gifted athlete by any means like I just like will be the first person there and the last person to leave and um yeah that was like interesting to hear the questions the way that they were phrased because I was like they were like coming down and I was like oh no oh no and I was like getting anxiety like trying to figure out like what question was going to be asked next <laughs> I was like oh so yeah that's my uh my input on it for me it was this um because I'm still in my sport but also trying to transition to prepare for when I'm out of it and my kind of tendency as an athlete is this perfectionism and so the the um you know the question about being critical about yourself and thinking more about your mistakes and this kind of like narrative where you get stuck on all the little things you could have done better and forget all the things that you did well. And I think that's also played into um, 
one of the other questions where it was, um, you know, the fear that you'll lose what you've got. Like if it was luck or if it, if you're focused on the fail, the mistakes, this fear that you could lose something that you had, but if it's an, you know, if it's an innate quality that can't ever go away and carrying those accomplishments with you, that's something that I constantly have to bring back into my mind. Crystal? Krista, sorry. Oh, man. I, I was never an athlete growing up, and, and I, I came into, like, CrossFit and weightlifting and whatever late in life. Um, and like last year I actually won some things and now I'm just like, I don't know. I, I always am like, is it just cause like I was at the right competition and other people weren't there? Like, I, I don't know. And it's dumb because like, I know how, like, like what Tiffany said, like, I know how much work that I put in. Like I get up at four in the morning and, you know, spend two hours in my garage doing what I need to do so I don't know like it's you're like why do I think that way dumb but. yeah for me the big one in sport was actually the last one uh I have this feeling and, and I think it comes from like feeling like I started bobsled late wish maybe wishing I had started it earlier uh, also knowing that like, I don't know that I would have been ready for the rigors of like Olympics, the Olympic space at a young age, but like, I have this feeling every summer that I'm just like too old and too slow. And I, and like, I'm going to be forced to retire when I'm not ready to. Um, and I have this need for things to feel complete. Mm. Like they need to feel finished or like it just, it really bothers me. So like for me, um, mm. I, I feel like the, the first four years of my career, I really mapped out in my head how things were going to go and the challenges I was going to have. And I was comfortable with that. And I was like, but at the end of it all, I'm going to win a gold medal at the Olympics. And I know this sounds silly because I have an Olympic medal, but the fact that I did everything I was supposed to do and, and still didn't win a gold medal just really freaking bothers me. <laughs> and I think it's the reason I'm still in bobsled because it, my it feels unfinished it's like need to control how things play out in all areas of my life you know creates a deeper like deeper root of imposter syndrome for, for me and like for me my thing is I need to, to learn to let go and that like realize that things can be great without being perfect uh, which is hard as an athlete right especially yeah. in the Olympic space like we're supposed to be perfect on the, those days that we compete. Um, and I felt like I was perfect, it, but it, it, the result wasn't, you know? Anyone else wanna share? Um, I did like what you said about the it, life can be great, but not perfect. Um, and I think that's even something to sit with now, just with those of us that really want control over our lives. I don't think any of us like planned the last four months to be the way they were. <laughs> um, so I would just say like that, you know, in a, in small and big ways, I think that that's like a really good thing to repeat to like, even if it turns into like in the day, what small things were great or what big things were great, even if it wasn't a perfect day because you didn't get to do it the way you wanted, but you still did something that created happiness for yourself or other people. I think that was, anyways, that's how I took it. But I just, I like that point that you made because I've been struggling with that one. You know, I have people check in with me and they're like, so how'd your day go? I'm like, eh. Yeah, because you're like, you could have done all these great things and you f completely forget because all you focus is on like the one email you forgot to send a week ago. Yeah. Like I had a speaking engagement yesterday and the group was really cool. And there was like one thing I said uh, that I just not wish I could take back, but I was like, should I have said that? Because I like to push the limit of like the stuff that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> it was a curse word. 
<laughs> it landed well, but I'm always like, I don't want to alienate anybody. And so like, I did, she didn't write a review right away. I didn't get hear from her at all. Like, you know, people followed me on Instagram, but they didn't like, they didn't come running at me telling me how great it was. And it was like, it, it, it bothered me enough that I woke up at three 30 this morning <laughs> and I like by five, I looked at my, I looked at my phone and she emailed me and she was like, that was awesome. And I was like, <laughs> but I'm like, why do I need her to validate me in that was awesome? Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Like, I wonder if it's when we take those leaps out of our comfort zone that we really tie ourselves to needing that external validation, even if it's not something that fits with our personality usually. Like, it sounds like oh, pretty much everyone on here is like driven internally. Like, it's not your drive doesn't come from external validation. But I feel like when we pop out of our box, like, whatever that instance is that you're like, oh, somebody tell me that was an awesome idea. Cause, it, cause you just need that. It, like I'm naked, I'm vulnerable. Just like, tell me something. This is great. So I can like move past that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about, um, like, I think it's great to talk about the issue, but let's talk about some ways to solve for this. So. Sure. Yes. I'm going to do back to my screen share here. So, um, I can pull up my slides again. And so now that we've kind of named it and we've talked about it, um, let's talk about what we can do to kind of combat it a little bit here. Right. So tips to combat imposter syndrome. Um, one is we want to get off autopilot. So we want to talk a little bit about self-talk and you all, while we were debriefing this last exercise, we talked about like, what are the thoughts that are going on in our brain? So understanding what self-talk is, right? That self-talk is your internalized narrative. So it's the things that you say to yourself. Um, you're probably very familiar with it when you're, you know, competing, right? In terms of what are the things that you need to say? How are you saying it? Um, how does that now go into the rest of your life when you're thinking about your life and your business? Is your self-talk the same or is it a little bit different, right? When you're on the field, when you're competing, you're probably saying things to yourself internalized in terms of like tips and cues that are going to get your body to move in a different way and get your body to do the performance that you need it to do, right? And that's kind of what we think about from like a sports psychology perspective as neutral self-talk. And that's what allows us to kind of get in the flow of activity is because we're thinking about cues for our body. We're not necessarily saying, oh, you're so bad at that. Oh, you sucked at that. Oh, you did it. You know, you're not saying those things when you're competing. You're actually giving yourself internalized cues on how your body should move. And so when we think of that outside of sport, right, we think of that in the business world, we're walking into a very new and uncomfortable environment. It could just be on Zoom. Honestly, you could be interviewing on Zoom and you're thinking, oh, I've never done this before. Where should I look? Who's looking at me? Blah, blah, blah. Like all those things are negative self-talk, right? And that gets you out of your comfort zone. And it's very different than the ways that we talk to ourselves when we're doing something that we feel capable of, right? And so what you want to do is start to identify what are the things that make you uncomfortable and how does your self-talk then react to that? So if you're in an uncomfortable situation, are you positive in terms of self-talk? Are you negative in terms of self-talk or are you neutral? Because neutral is where you're going to start to achieve what we call in sports, that flow state. And it's the same thing when you're thinking about it in terms of a business perspective or kind of, you know, transitioning from competing to going into like more business ventures, right? You still need to get into the flow state, right? The next thing is separate feelings from facts. So what are facts about your life and what are feelings? Those two things are very different, right? The way you feel about something is not necessarily a fact. And so as Cheryl, we, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. We can't see your screen at all. What? <laughs> it's, just, it's just white. We, Lauren is wait, she, Lauren's been sitting here waiting for a pause. She's like, she's gonna, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. <laughs> you can't see my screen? <laughs> hey. Okay. Well, here's my screen. Sorry. Hopefully that made sense without my screen. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. Um, but now it was on separate feelings from facts, right? So we're going to talk about uh, separate, separating that. So what are we talking about when we talk about facts? Start a list. So if you have a paper and a pen, if you have uh, your phone, if you have, you know, like your computer next to you or something like that, you can open up a new tab or something. Just start brainstorming a list. Doesn't have to be perfect. Again, we're away from like the perfectionistic tendencies, right? Just start brainstorming a list of the things that are factual to your life. 
So what are things that, you know, are facts, you know, uh, are you an Olympian? Are you a Paralympian? Are you a professional athlete? Are these things facts about your life, right? Like if, if, if somebody is kind of talking to you and what you're doing, um, are those things facts? Did, did you graduate from college? Are you a student athlete? Were you a student athlete? These are all facts about your life, right? Uh, were you a scholar athlete? Were you an academic All-American? Were you an All-American? Were you an All-Conference? Were you a player of the week? Any of these things, like just start kind of brainstorming what are, what is factual uh, to your life? Um, you know, did you serve your country? Did any of these things that could just be interpreted as like facts, but that you somehow downplay, right? Just write down that list. No, um, no self-talk kind of in it. Just, you know, don't downplay anything. Don't even, you know, it's, it's not even about bragging. It's just like, what are factual accomplishments that you have uh, as a part of your almost resume, right? It's like, th these are things that we also do in terms of resume building. The next thing is unmasking your villain. So we want to eliminate toxic people and situations from your life. Lauren, do you want to talk a little bit more about like the toxicity here? Yeah, absolutely. This was big for me. Um, there was like a phase and I, I noticed it. I was in like Placid, uh, I think last fall. So that's a training center up in upstate New York. I would wake up uh, really excited for the day and end the day angry and anxious and frustrated uh, with myself because I don't like feeling angry. And so I realized that there was a lot of external things that were impacting how I felt about myself, about the world, about my experience, about what I should be doing. Uh, you know, when you're 36 years old and you essentially live in a dorm uh, and all your friends are getting married or having kids or like getting promotions and like, they're like, no, but it's cool. Cause like, you're an Olympian. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool, but it, it's not something I can do forever. And then just kind of this feeling of like, you know, am I in the right space? You know, other people's highlight reels are impacting how I feel about myself. And then just some of the, the crap that you see on social media isn't helpful. And I think it's hard right where we are right now in this space, right? Because we're in this space of like awakening and understanding and listening and we're having really difficult conversations, but I think it's so important to discern like which of those conversations are difficult, painful, and productive, and which of those conversations are just difficult, painful, and unnecessary, right? And so I always say, uh, eliminate, your, eliminate toxic people and situations from your life. Um, and even if those people who have always been in your life, this is something I tell my mom. I'm like, you know, the level up your friends, like her <laughs> friends are jealous of her and they, they're like rude to her about it. And I'm like, you're an angel. You're perfect. Anybody who thinks differently can go pound sand. And she's like, Lauren, you're so vulgar. And I'm like, I don't care. Um, I will, you know, you got to fiercely defend your heart, your soul, your energy, all of it. Um, and I think it's important to use daily affirmations. Something I've started doing is, uh, for those of you who follow me, I do a thankful Thursday post every Thursday and, um, like Wednesday night at 10 PM, I was getting ready to go to bed and I was like, I don't have a thankful Thursday post. And what it does is it forces me no matter what's going on, because I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a driver. I'm always like, I'm gonna do this next. I'm gonna do this next. I'm gonna do this next and this next. And I don't feel like I take enough time to appreciate the things that I've accomplished and just be proud of myself for a second or just be grateful for things that are going on in my life. And so I take time to do thankful Thursday. And my, my favorite part about it is getting the community that follows me talking about what they're thankful for. Um, because in a time where the world is a big freaking dumpster fire, uh, it's amazing how the little things that we've taken for granted have become big things that we're really thankful for. So you can use daily affirmations. I, I try and use gratitude uh, for things that uh, not, not increase my imposter syndrome, but just things that I need to recognize in my life um, that I'm thankful for. My last one was, you know, a, a company that I work with, but the one before that was my freckles. Cause like I grew up hating my freckles because it was different and uh, you don't want to be different when you're a kid. And then grow your mindset with, with process goals. Like it's just that growth mindset, the ability 
to continually push yourself um, to grow, to, you know, dive into your feelings and have a better understanding about what's going on in your head and why uh, and process that I think is really important. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Lauren. And um, in terms of growing your mindset, there's a great book by Dr. Carol Dweck. Um, it's called Mindset, and it really dives in quite a bit in ter terms of like growth and fixed mindset. So if you haven't read that book, I would highly suggest it. All right, next slide. Ah! Oh no, my slides aren't working for some reason. <laughs> Maybe you should stop sharing and then reshare. Yeah, let me stop share and reshare. Sorry about that. Sure, I'll, I wanted to add something while you're doing it, just to sure. occupy the time. One of the things that that um, that I have found helpful uh, uh, too is that all of you on this phone are usually so uh, have accomplished so much. And my background is an engineer, and I use numbers to do it. So. You know how you, you, you talked earlier about putting specific things like, okay, here are your accomplishment, accomplishments. Just do the same thing just in numbers. Like how many, you know, I'm a, a college grad and then you're a certain percentage of the population. Then I played four years of sports and then that. I am an Olympian. You're going to find out that most of you are literally one in a million. And those things can help you. So that actually doing those facts, and I've done that a number of times of my life after people trying to beat the self-esteem out of me all most of my adult life, is that if you do things numerically like that, it really helps. And you're going to be so like, you'll be like, it's, it's, it's very much like putting those uh, objective things. And you can get those numbers. You can look up and there's data for everything. How many people in the United States make an Olympic team, right? So you can look during your lifetime and see how many made an Olympic team, how many were all conference. And you'd be amazed that how small or how special each of you are or that have accomplished so much. So I find that helpful. I like that. I use that, um, I use that when I was, a, a woman wanted me to come speak to her company, but she wanted me to do it for free. And she was telling me all these high power CEOs uh, that have come and spoken to them for free. And I mm -hmm. did the math and I said, the, the p probability of me becoming a CEO is much higher than becoming a winter Olympian and a winter Olympic medalist. So what? bye. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so here are some things numerically that you can do as well. One you're already doing by attending a webinar. The whole goal of parity is to empower female athletes, right? This is a one thing that we're doing, um, in terms of dispelling even imposter syndrome for us. Like we can't empower ourselves unless we, you know, dispower really imposter syndrome. So connect with your fellow female athletes through ventures like parity, right? Connect, show up to the town halls, show up to the webinars and trainings, um, mentor, mentorships that's huge for female athletes and, 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 and female business professionals as well as to be able to have mentorships and that's something that we talk about in our webinars quite a bit is how to build mentors um, and ask for help don't be afraid to ask for help nobody can do this alone we're doing this together collectively as the world is uh, a dumpster fire as Lauren eloquently put it <laughs> <laughs> we're here for each other. We want to build community. We want to show up for each other and we want to empower each other. So this is a step that we can do in that direction. Um, time is cutting short here. If you want to get a hold of us, please email Lauren or myself. Our next week's topic is going to be on how to nail interviews and it's going to be in a virtual setting as well, how to do it virtually and in person if we ever get back to kind of in-person life. Um, but before we end, we wanted to stop with our uh, favorite inspirational video. Shall I go ahead and play it here, Lauren? <laughs> All right. If people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you think you can do, good. Stay that way. Because what non-believers fail to understand is that calling a dream crazy is not an insult. It's a compliment. Don't try to be the fastest runner in your school or the fastest in the world. Be the fastest ever. Don't picture yourself wearing OBJ's jersey. 
picture OBJ wearing yours. Don't settle for homecoming queen or linebacker. Do both. Lose 120 pounds and become an Iron Man after beating a brain tumor. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. If you're born a refugee, don't let it stop you from playing soccer for the national team at age 16. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. When they talk about the greatest team in the history of the sport, make sure it's your team. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football. Play it at the highest level. And if you're a girl from Compton, don't just become a tennis player. Become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. Gets me every time. Every time. Every time. <laughs> every time. Every time. Well, I hope this has been one of the most recognized. <laughs> 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 Still my computer, world. sorry. <laughs> so I hope this has been valuable. Um, I hope that uh, we've at least given you something to think about, work on, and realize that you're not alone in whatever feelings that you're having and that uh, parody is meant to be a resource to help you accomplish, achieve, go figure out, learn whatever it is that you want to do and learn. So um, I hope you will join us for the next one. I hope you will spread the word and um, encourage others to as well. And I hope you all have a fun and safe weekend. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.